is everyone and welcome to the very first episode of Pop Stream, the brand new streaming channel from your friends at Denver Pop Culture Con and Pop Culture Classroom, where your community comes together to talk about your media because this is your Pop Stream. So how does Pop Stream work? Pop Stream will be live every week on our own YouTube and Twitch channels, as well as the Pop Culture Classroom and Denver Pop Culture Con, YouTube, Twitch, and social media channels live on Thursdays at 4 p.m. Mountain Time, where you can watch and join in the conversation in the chat. Um, so don't be shy. Say hi if you're there. Um, every episode will also be available on demand on YouTube starting on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. So if you can't catch us live, you can always catch us after the fact. Uh, and coming soon, we will be on your favorite podcast services as well. Um, so if the audio uh, only version is your thing while you're driving in your car, uh, we got you covered. So my name is Matt Slater, and I will be your pop stream host every week. Um, we're going to get to know each other very well, uh, week to week. And if you want to get to know me a little bit better, you can find me at Maddie Slay on Instagram, Twitter, and Twitch. Uh, but those are brand new accounts. So be nice internet. Uh, I know how you go. Um, have fun with that, Matt. <laughs> yeah, right. Just, it's brand new. Go have fun. Do, do your thing. Um, but that's not the only place where you can interact with the show. If you're watching live right now on YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, or Twitter, uh, say hi, drop something in the chat. Uh, and if you're nice to each other, we might incorporate your comments into the show. All right, so this is season one of PopStream. Uh, and for season one, we will have weekly virtual shows that rotate throughout the month uh, with unique content for you. So no matter what pop culture you're into, we are gonna have something for you. Uh, and today we've got the first episode of Popstream Comics, which is our once monthly show all about comics. Comics. Uh, yay, go figure. <laughs> um, and today I am joined by our regular comics cast. So these guys will join us for every comics episode once a month. First of all, we've got Tara Necessary. Tara, how you doing? Hello. And then we've got uh, <laughs> Dion Harris. Dion, what's up? Hello. Uh, I would love for you guys to introduce yourselves uh, and tell everybody a little bit about yourselves. Who are you? What do we need to know about you? Uh, Tara, why don't you go first? All right, so my name is Tara Necessary. Um, I am one of the Atomic Pixies. We're a Denver-based art group. We've been doing art and cons in Denver and kind of around the country for like 16 years or something. So chances are, if you go to cons, you may have run into me. We make uh, what we call Art Nerd Vos, which are Art Nouveau themed art. Um, and <laughs> They're I, awesome. <laughs> yeah, I am just a super huge nerd. I am a nerd about art. I am a nerd about comics. I, I just I, I love loving things. So um, hopefully that will be something we can all do together. Um, and I, I didn't quite cosplay <laughs> today, but I've got like, I'm Klaus bound instead of <laughs> I mean, that, that is... Disney bound. <laughs> if you've seen uh, season two of the show, you could be like part of his cult. The Destiny. You know, true, yeah. I was almost going to go full 70s like that, but like it's hot and <laughs> cool. yeah. it is hot. i don't know about you i don't have ac in my house so uh you know denver it gets real hot sometimes yeah. Dion, who are you what do we need to know about you all right so my name is Dion harris and some of you on twitch probably know me as the shoot thief uh, i used to be one of the mods for the adobe channel um art wise i am a huge art nerd uh, a huge comic book nerd a huge video game nerd a huge role-playing game nerd so just <laughs> yes. a big nerd all in general so <laughs> a well-rounded um, nerd yeah a well-rounded nerd <laughs> <laughs> um art wise i guess um a lot of the things that i'm working on right now are just different comic books um i also work in the board game industry uh for paizo um peterson games a couple of others but yeah Wait, what do you I'm what do you do a, for them um basically i do like a lot of a uh, character and monster work Okay, and uh, nice. a lot of a, um, I guess they're called spot illustrations for the different uh, source books and things like that. Um, so yeah, I'm a, a character and creature guy, not so much an environmental guy. Okay, but uh, I'm working on that. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well. As I mentioned, this is our Pop Streams Comics cast. So once a month when we have Pop Streams Comics, you will be greeted by us as well as a new guest every week. Today, it's just three of us so that everyone listening and watching can kind of get to know your regular cast. Uh, but starting next month, we're going to have awesome guests. They might be uh, comic creators. They might be uh, 
shop owners from the local community or uh, enthusiast group or uh, content creators. So we're going to have all kinds of people joining us to get some fresh and unique perspective here on the Popstream Comics show. Um, so you'll get this once a month. Next week, we'll have the Popstream Workshop, and that's one of our other shows. So the Popstream uh, Workshop is where you get workshops and demonstrations from professionals, uh, many of whom are all from our Denver Pop Culture Con community. Uh, and just like next week's guest, uh, Dustin Resch, who is an exhibitor from Denver Pop Culture Con, who will be showing us how to create unconventional superheroes. Um, so you'll join me for that show along with our um, Denver Pop Culture Con's Master of Programming, Bruce McIntosh. So it'll be Bruce and I for every one of those and then our rotating guest. And then the following week, we've got the Popstream AV Club which is the pop stream show all about film, TV, and video games. And this month, we're going to be talking about The Boys on Amazon Prime. I am working through it right now. Uh, very excited to talk about that one. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, we'll round out each cycle with Pop Stream's Denver Pop Culture Con flashback. And that's where Bruce and I will get together again and highlight some of the very best panels from uh, previous Denver Pop Culture Cons. One of the things we want to do with this podcast, we remember cons, you guys? Remember yeah. how fun cons are? Oh and so much are, like <laughs> the conversations <laughs> that time. yeah the <laughs> conversations that you get to have with friends at cons that's our goal here is to be having those conversations with you guys on our stream um and so we're going to see some of our favorite panels from past cons and this month we're doing all about uh the science of wakanda and i see that Ooh. uh bruce is in the house uh in our bruce. chat uh bruce says he is in the house so nice uh he and i will be doing a lot of this together <laughs> um and then after that uh, we're going to rotate again. So the next month you'll get episode two of all the shows that we just described. This, our comic show with these beautiful faces you see today, um, you know, and then we'll go through the, the cycle again. And I cannot forget to shout out our producer in the back, uh, Liz. What's up, Liz? <laughs> so every now and then, yeah, when we need uh, to pull up some information or, you know, Liz has some juicy tidbits for us, she'll be popping up. All right, so... <laughs> This is PopStream Comics. This is your PopStream Comics cast. Um, and we want to kind of, I want to know, you know, what is your comics story? Like, how did you get into comics? How did you discover comics? What is it you love about them? What, how has your relationship with, with comics changed? Um, so Dion, let's start with you. Sure. Um, so I think I originally got into comics at around the age of, um, 11. This is a, a couple of years after I moved to Colorado, actually. And um, I met a, a cool guy named Johnny, and uh, he took me over to his house. And his dad was actually a huge comic nerd. So he had like just boxes and boxes of comics in his basement. And we started reading them. And that was kind of like what really hooked me on art. Um, started with I'm, an endless supply of comics. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like the whole like Chris Claremont run of the X-Men was basically what I grew up on. Nice. And I just kind of like started branching out from there with like Mark Silvestri, um, his work on uh, the Wolverine series, which at the time was like super edgy because he was the first like comic book hero to like cut people and stuff like that. So I thought <laughs> that was like just amazing at that age. Um, and it kind of just like once I started reading comics, I knew that that was what I wanted to do with my life. Um, so from a pretty like early age, like I knew, I just knew that I was going to be drawing comics or doing something with art for the rest of my life. And I just never stopped drawing. As so a kid, were you kinda, like a, an innately like good artist? Did you just have those art skills or, you um, know, like were you, were you showing that talent at an early age? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I've been drawing since before I can even remember. Like my mom said, I think I was like three years old and I started like doing like family portraits of us with like all of us like kind of looking like little egg people, <laughs> but still she could tell like who was who by based on the hairstyles. And yeah, I just never started I drawing. That. I never stopped drawing since then. Nice. So, <laughs> and so yeah. from, from X-Men and your box of comics back in the beginning, how has that, mm -hmm. you know, grown and evolved? Oh man. So I really started out just like kind of tracing comic book pages and that was kind of how I started like developing like my visual storytelling style. And eventually I hooked up with um, uh, Stephen Brackett and Alan Brooks. Well, R. Alan Brooks, uh, Stephen Brackett from the Flowbots and R. Alan Brooks from the Burning Metronome. Just gonna name and, uh, uh, like the Flowbots, like 
the band, right? Yes, like, yeah. yes, the band. Yes. Yeah. That's my I'm just gonna too. name drop yeah. that in there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, Matt, they're like a local band and are super active in the local community oh, yeah. of arts and and like. I did not know that. Like no. That. Yep. Ninety three yeah. three KTCL discovered them. KTCL discovered a bunch of bands, and like that yeah. was one of theirs that they discovered, and they're really cool and really involved in the community. Even all since. of them are great. No people. idea. Yeah, I'll, I'll be straight up with our audience. Like, I may be your host, but when it comes to to knowledge about comics, Tara and Dion are who uh, they're they're going to be teaching me. Uh, I'm going to be learning right along with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so the the flow bots and then yeah. yeah, and so we all got together and we worked on our first like official comic book called Kaleidoscope, <laughs> which um, kind of fell apart, which was sad. But later on, me and Alan worked on the uh, Burning Metronome, which was much more successful. And yeah, I guess since then, I've just never stopped like, you know, like producing content. I, now I'm working on my own comic books. But um, yeah, yeah, I just never stopped. <laughs> are you drawn when you read comics? Are you drawn to a specific like genre or style or, uh, you know, favorite writers or artists or anything like that? I used to be, but. I think I used to be like more focused on the art aspect of comic books, mm. but as I like grew and matured, I realized that, you know, the writing is what makes a great comic book. Mm. So I really like branched out from there. And uh, while there are like certain artists I really love, like, you know, Jim Lee and um, uh, Kim Jung Gi, uh, artists like that, uh, the writers are really what makes the books for me. So like Matt Fraction, and uh, Brian Michael Bendis. I mean, all of the same people that I'm sure Tara's gonna name as well. <laughs> because we have ones. like a lot of overlap, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so now I really go more for like the writers as opposed to like the artists, because I mean, the art doesn't have to be great to make like a really compelling story, so yeah. Very true, yeah. All right, well, Tara, how about you? What's your comic story? So, I mean, I am the nerd child of nerd parents. Like, if I had been a boy, my name would have been Luke Skywalker. Like, <laughs> um, and, uh, that, or that was an option. But, um, so I've always been, like, I went to my first Starfest, which is, like, both one of the oldest sci-fi conventions in the nation and our oldest in Denver. Um, I was going to that at, like, seven, eight years old. So I always had this kind of nerdy surroundings um but i remember being in the library and i was going through the adult fantasy section to get books at like fourth grade because that was who i was um <laughs> and i found a big volume of elf quest and at that time elf quest came in these huge beautiful hardback cover so beautiful. color ones yeah and i just absorb those as solidly as I could <laughs> but it didn't at that didn't really click into my mind that this was like a thing that took like a couple years later I saw the commercials for Sailor Moon on TV and something in my soul just knew like <laughs> I would stay up at 6 a.m I would get up at 6 a.m and that's like the only thing in my life that has ever regularly got me up at 6 a.m to watch Sailor Moon I would do my hair in little buns and tie like Christmas ribbons in and this was in like 1998 this was not when cosplaying in <laughs> school was cool i don't know nice. how i did not get beat up more because yeah um, but uh but you got, it's because so, you rocked it so well it was just yeah, respect it, from everybody it's just like everybody knew me as the sailor moon girl but they either loved me or didn't dislike me enough that i figured it out nice. <laughs> but um so that started drawing me from that i figured out like that there was more to Sailor Moon than I was accessing on, you know, channel 20 at six in the morning. So that <laughs> like tempted me into comic book shops with both, which both hooked me on comics forever, particularly manga and finding out that like, there was so much feminine energy there in like creators and characters and plot lines that were not just like you know super sexy superhero girls there was dumb teenage girls and ugly girls and all sorts of different girls having adventures <laughs> and a lot of them being written by girls and so that really enthralled me and I got a Sailor Moon art book and started tracing that and that got me involved in the art and that's when it sparked off that like you can tell any kind of stories in this format and it opens mm -hmm. it up so much and becomes so accessible that like yeah in the same format you can have umbrella academy mm -hmm. and 
you know, Hello Kitty co comic storylines. And those two things can exist in the same genre and completely thrive within it. And I think that and the realization that I could do that also just was like. <gasps> <laughs> yeah, that's it. You know, it's funny because like, I guess we are so entrenched in this world that sometimes I forget that for so many people, when you say comics, it's just superheroes. And that's the first thing that yeah. pops to mind. Um, one of the things we do at Pop Culture Classroom is is workshops for people. And I was pitching some workshops to to some folk and they said, oh, but we have an older audience. I don't know if they'll, if, if comics and, you know, making comics is going to interest them. And it hit me. I was like, Oh, you think, you think I'm talking about superheroes. And mm -hmm. as soon yeah. as I kind of expressed that and talked about it, they were like, Oh, and you know, eyes lit up and like, there's so much more to that medium and so many different types of stories can be told. Oh, absolutely. Um, there's, this, yeah. there's this whole feeling right now in comics that DC and Marvel, some people say they're failing some people say they're thriving but like <laughs> this whole feeling that if they fail that comics will fail and that yeah. has been really baffling to me because i'm like no if they fail web comics are filling their place and indie yep. comics are filling their place i don't want either of them to fail and i don't necessarily think those critics are correct but i'm also like oh if they fail there's 800 people ready lined up to fill the spot like yeah. right you know it may not be the 20 something page single issues monthly anymore you know just like the music industry changed you know but mm -hmm. i i still buy my vinyl and i stream music right yeah. and so we're gonna have all and these it, different formats to enjoy yeah. and it opens up possibility that if you have like your music thing if you have one song you can get that one song out there and then work mm -hmm. on song two. Whereas before you had to have a whole album and they right. weren't so good. And comics is the same way. Yeah. You yeah. can put out a 10 page comic and that can be it. You can never get that published by DC. It yeah. could be the best 10 pages on earth and it wouldn't get published as a superhero comic. Nope. And actually so I wish that I mentioned uh, more indie comics when I was doing my little spiel because ElfQuest was without a doubt my biggest influence as a kid. And it wasn't a part of like DC or Marvel. So indie comics can be like pretty huge in, a, in everybody's lives. So. And an interesting yeah. note, ElfQuest was an indie comic that got so big that Marvel bought it. And they yeah. think Dark Horse has bought it. I think Dark Horse owns it now too. Oh, wow. So like indie comics can... <laughs> like they don't necessarily stay indie too yeah, yeah and our, our plethora of mediums so we actually ju i just got to have a conversation with uh brian fees who wrote um a fire story and lo i actually have this book right here this was not planned nice. i promise <laughs> but a fire story so it's his story about um losing his home in the 2017 california wildfires Ooh, and yeah. so the the night after his house burned to the ground, his first instinct was, I have to draw, I have to create a comic about this. And he posted a short web comic, right? And his web comic about his experience went viral, which then convinced Abrams and his publisher to approach him and say, this web comic was so awesome. Let's make a whole graphic novel out of this, right? So like these all work together in, in tandem. Well, I think yeah. it lost the I think it lost the uh, title, but for a long time, the longest written literature in the human language was Homestuck, which is a web comic, mm -hmm. oh, a yeah. very intense but also very ridiculous web comic. <laughs> <laughs> and that's yeah. also where the video game Unders Tale is like its spiritual grandkid oh, because yeah. <laughs> the guy who made it lived in the guy's basement. So like, I did oh, not wow. know that. I, me yeah, yeah, Toby Fox lived in uh, uh, what's his face? That's why there's so many. There's tons of like undertale references or homestuck references and undertale and stuff wow. and that's why as he was like couch surfing in his house <laughs> we cool. uh we just got some news about the undertale sequel that it's going to be a while before we get it but uh, we'll talk about that more in our pop stream av club uh yeah. <laughs> tara you talked to us about kind of your comics awakening you know how has that evolved and where are you now with comics so, well, it, I have evolved a lot because I first started making comics to impress a boy in my class in seventh grade. And like, <laughs> you know, sometimes that's what it takes. <laughs> I, kept the art. I didn't keep boys, but I kept the art. <laughs> and yeah, so now, I mean, now I have, I'm kind of with Dion where like, I definitely have artists and creators I like, but I am a lot more about like, 
the less I know about a comic, the more likely I am to pick it. Oh, that sounds so hipster. But like, <laughs> like, I love, but like going like, in blind, it, there's that appeal, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like I love, I love Batman. I love X-Men. Like they are so near and dear to my heart, but I don't think I love anything more than like picking up a comic and not knowing what's going to be in it and just going on like a wild ride. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Sometimes an unsuccessful wild ride, but that's part of it. And that's one of the nice <laughs> things about comics is it takes me, you know, an hour at most to do my first read through. So like, if I hate it, it's not like I've spent four hours invested in this thing to find out I hated it. And if I loved it, I could turn around and reread it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I guess my, like, I got into comic. You know, my first ones were peanuts when I was a kid. Uh, when I was a kid, I lived in South Korea for a couple of years. Oh, wow. um, and so it, you could find English reading material just fine. But I was also a 10 year old that didn't like to read. Um, but I discovered <laughs> like, oh, peanuts. No, and, I can't. Dang. Yeah, I found some. Uh, it, they were in English, but they were Korean publishings of peanuts and, um, you know, read through a bunch of those, but really didn't even touch comics again until. Um, probably the walking dead and actually no i take that back oh nice in college so we'll get to this but i was a huge huge my chemical romance fan and so <laughs> when i heard that gerard way had created a comic i picked up one issue of the umbrella academy and to this day mm -hmm. i probably couldn't tell you which issue it was I, I don't really remember it that much i remember the image of the white violin yeah that was about it yeah. um but i that it, it didn't hook me um, and so it wasn't until the walking dead came around, you know, I watched the TV show and then I played the telltale video game. I'm pretty oh, sure nice. I played that first, which just made me realize that like, yeah, the show's great, but like this franchise is an amazing franchise, which mm -hmm. led me to, okay, what else, what else can we do? And so I started the walking dead comics and fell in love with those. And I've read every issue, um, and just loved them. And then again, video games got me in again because Telltale, who did The Walking Dead, also did The Wolf Among Us, which yes. is based on the Fables uh, comic oh, series. Oh, Fable is beautiful. Uh, yeah, so beautiful. I, there's so much of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's in mind. I've always wanted to read it, and every time I've tried, I've like picked it up, and I'll be like, oh, this is volume one. And then it's like, actually, it's volume one of season four of Snow yeah. White's <laughs> side tale. And I'm like, well, yep. never mind. <laughs> so yeah. much. <laughs> so I, I've read like 10 volumes of Fables, but then after a while, nice. that was you know the only thing thing I was reading and kind of fell off there. Um, but, you know, having this job at Pop Culture Classroom and having a plethora of comics at my disposal <laughs> and, you know, being part of the Excellence in Graphic Literature Awards, I've gotten to read a lot and have just fallen in love with the medium. Um, nice. But, you know, I'm very aware that when you guys reference specific like artists and, 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 you know, writers and specific runs of different things, I'm going to nod my head and be like, yeah, but uh, I haven't read that probably. Um, <laughs> but I'm ready to dive in and get excited. Um, but, you know, yes. Sandman, like really got me in. And yeah. um, so I've just Sandman's fallen in love with a few different yeah. Art. Like, I mean, that's oh, all, yeah. all comics are art, but like Sandman is one that transcends in a certain way. Like, so yeah, I was a, I was a theater major in college and I feel like, you know, just having all that kind of arts background and, and I, the amount that Sandman incorporates Shakespeare and references to so many, you know, other uh, older materials. I just fell in love with the theatricalness of it and the, and the art style. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, now I just, I, I, I love it. I, I, so I keep a, a note on my phone of like all the media that I consume within a year, the video games I play, the, uh, the movies I watch and my books list currently for this year is all graphic novels. <laughs> nice. Not a single prose book on there. That's awesome. So uh, that's, that's where <laughs> I'm at. Uh, Christopher chimed in in the chat and he he also loves ElfQuest. Uh, he yes. said that his comics <laughs> as a kid were uh, X-Men, the uh, X-Men Vertigo comics. Um, and then he said a bunch of indie stuff as well. Um, mm. And I definitely, one of these shows, we're going to have to do a topic of the show that's just indie comics, like highlighting mm -hmm. some of our very, very favorite indie comics. Um, and then we also have Steve McKay on Facebook. Steve says, howdy, congrats on your first show. Umbrella Academy is awesome in both the comic and the TV show. Nice. Uh, so we thanks, Steve. Into that, yeah. I'm just gonna write hello on my hand every episode, so I can just like, hello. Hello. what's up? Hello. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> All right. So one of the features I do want to do on this show, um, we will get to our topic of the show, but I always want to check in and see just like 
what are you guys reading right now? What's good? Uh, you know, and this is for our audience too. So we're going to talk about what we're reading right now. Feel free to comment on what we're reading or let us know what you're reading so that we can, you know, get some good stuff in as many hands as possible. Tara, I heard that you are currently reading, and this is not a comic and that's okay, but you're reading Dune. Yes. Yes. Like uh, <laughs> most of the nerd population, I'm trying to read it before the movie comes out. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't watched the preview because I didn't want it spoiled, but then my friend pointed out that I was past the point that they think the movie's going to cover. So now I might go watch it because the nice. screenshots do look very pretty, but I'm, oh. I'm enjoying it a lot. Like, and besides a few couple, th- a couple things, like I don't, I don't feel like it's aged at all, even in like, oh, it still holds up. But like, if somebody told me this book came out two years ago, I'd be like, okay. <laughs> like, um, yeah, it still, it still really holds up. I really like that the story is about the guy and his mom, which I did not realize it. I mean, I knew oh. him and his mom were characters in it, but I didn't realize how much the book was going to be specifically about their relationship mm-hmm. and the world building's great. And I, I'm really enjoying it and really looking forward. Like I said, I haven't watched the preview, but I've looked at like, well, you know, this person is this person and all, oh, they're going to be great. So like, I'm really <laughs> excited. It was a good cast. Oh, yeah. yeah. All star cast. His name? Um, <laughs> Oscar Isaacs. I'm really mm-hmm. excited about. Yeah. Him, dad. yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm really excited about Timothy Chalamet because I will admit I have the biggest crush on Kyle McLaughlin, but I haven't seen the old movie either. And I'm like, how? How is he this character at all? This is like a 15 year old boy. I don't understand. <laughs> like, I love you, Kyle McLaughlin, but what? <laughs> <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, and I haven't read Dune either. I, I should probably get Me on neither. that. Me neither. Um, oh, okay, I don't feel so bad anymore then. <laughs> I think I was way too young when I first saw Dune because I watched it again when I was, I think, around like 33 or something like that. And I just didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> I did see it yeah. when I was like five. And all I really remember of that is like, Sandworms. Yeah. <laughs> right. And because of that, I was like, trimmers? No, not trimmers. Yeah, like, trimmers and Beetlejuice, <laughs> like Beetlejuice, trimmers, and that yes. was I saw at the same time. I thought there was a large issue with sandworms, which living mm-hmm. in the desert was probably not a good thing for my parents. To <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I had nightmares about that too, Tara. So you're not alone. No way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you're also reading Lock and Key right now. Yeah which oh, so is good. not necessarily just because of uh, it being one of our topics for next week or next month, although that did get my butt in gear. But um, <laughs> yeah, I'm a huge, huge, huge Stephen King fan. And mm-hmm. so I wanted to try some of Joe Hill's stuff and I had watched Horns, which was a great movie, but also <laughs> I will never watch it again. Because Wait, is, that a, is that a, did Joe Hill write it? Yeah, he wrote the book ah, for for horns. Um, I did not know that. Yep. Mm. Um. And and I I've really enjoyed Joe Hill's writing, although at least with not so much horns, but lock and key, he's because I know he's very like, or at least was very like, don't judge me based on my dad's writing. And I'm like, well, maybe <laughs> stop writing about small weird towns in Maine <laughs> know, right? and keys <laughs> and <Maybe>. magical children. <laughs> <laughs> that is fair. Very yeah. fair. But at the same time, I think I think he he does like i don't feel like i'm even reading something like i feel i don't feel like he's in any way like just mooching in on his dad's territory like i feel like he mm. is really good at making something in its own even while still using that same recipe and like i love the art it's so i oh, thought man. i hated it at first because they're not necessarily attractive people right it, yeah but like the more i read it the more i'm like but these are exactly the faces that need to be telling this story yeah. there's something like kind of jarring about the art style when you first see it and yeah. but yeah as it goes on it just all fits together Umbrella you know Academy's we'll save that the same way <laughs> we'll, yeah, we'll save is. that for uh next yeah, so next, next month <laughs> right as Tara mentioned, next month, our topic of the show is going to be Sandman and Lock and Key. That'll be our double header for next month because the, that crossover series uh, will be coming out Ooh. right around, starting right around the same time. So yeah. we'll be talking about both of those next month. Uh, Dion, what are you, uh, you told me you're reading Saga right now. Yes. Oh, and if anybody hasn't like read so- Saga yet and you're like a creator, uh, Saga is kind of like writing the book on world creation right now. Or world if you creation. haven't read Saga so, yet, read it. Exactly. It's <laughs> I'll, I'll so get on good. that. <laughs> it is so good. I mean, just the 
the give me, world okay, so is amazing. I've I've heard it compared to uh, as uh, compared to Game of Thrones. Um, you know, how would you? <laughs> what's kind of like the overall short synopsis for Saga for you know someone like me who should be more up to date on their reading? Um, I guess the 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 shortest synopsis. I mean, the best way I can put it is it's kind of like a uh, space opera love story. Games of it's Game like, of Thrones. It's like if a stormtrooper <laughs> like and a Jedi had a baby. Yes. And so the whole galaxy decided they had to destroy them because they're not allowed. Yes. Ah, okay, so like cool. she's like a Jedi, or no, she's like a, a stormtrooper and he's like a Jedi. Yeah. And and everyone's very unhappy that they had a baby. <laughs> yes. But I will also say that it's um it's kind of uh deals with more adult themes. Oh, yeah. So be careful. Um like, it's not fun, the, like so. Age. Oh yeah, it's, yes, it's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's fun. It's fun, but not Star Wars fun. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's definitely more of an adult book. But um, um, let's see. Uh, someone uh, recommended Mooncakes here. Um, they say it's an adorable little queer urban fantasy one shot. Um, so thank you for that recommendation, Beverly. Uh, let's see. Iris Storm says Saga is amazing. Uh, they agree with yes. you. Yes, yes. <laughs> Christopher is reading The Sleeper Must Awaken, which I don't know. Do Ooh. either of you guys know that title? No, but that sounds I don't sounds know it, really but it sounds amazing, yeah. It does, yeah. We'll have to do a, a, a quick Google on that one. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Once and Future Plus Die, or Once and Future Die. Mm-hmm. I've never heard of that either. Uh, Christopher, you got all the deep cuts. I'm going to need you to share <laughs> these uh, with the team. <laughs> I do know Mooncakes. That's been one on my reading list. Oh, okay. Um, and then Steve says that, uh, you know, he recommends the Sandman adaptation or he doesn't recommend. He says he's heard good things about the Sandman adaptation on Audible. And oh. I will admit I, the cast looks awesome. I'm skeptical. I'm like, how how does the graphic novel translate to to Audible? Yeah. Um, but I I haven't given it a shot yet. So I don't know. I mean, so I have not listened to that. But uh, Neil Gaiman, who's the Sandman author, his American Gods was hands down my favorite audiobook I've ever listened to. So in good. Part because really? it had a cast. And that so full it was, cast recording. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, yeah it, so it makes a big difference for me. And I, I don't dislike audiobooks, but having a cast it, like makes it from like a cool experience to like. Yeah, well, I love <laughs> audiobooks i'm just like how how do you translate the story of a graphic novel when the it's so much of it is dependent on the art to an yeah. audiobook um so if anybody Check has has out. heard that and you have a yay or nay on that definitely let us know in the chat um mm-hmm. and then a couple more recommendations uh let's see monstrous and birthright oh. i've read the first two volumes of monstrous and it is gorgeous is so beautiful i it's love a beautiful the book. art but i couldn't get into the plot like it felt like, and I should try again because this sometimes happens at the beginning, but I felt mm-hmm. like it was trying to feed me everything that it felt like I should like. <laughs> yeah, vo- volume one was very guilty of lots of different, they introduced a lot of characters and a lot oh, of storylines yeah. in volume one. Volume two, is a, it's a little bit easier to follow. Um, and I haven't read beyond that personally, but mm-hmm. I, I agree with you. That first read, I was like, what? What's yeah. going on? <laughs> yeah, it was very confusing in the beginning. <laughs> Um, so currently I am reading, uh, this guy right here, the comic book history of comics. Um, and this is the second volume, I believe of that one. Um, and this is, this is a textbook. Like this is dense. There are so many names and dates and, and, you know, like just history tidbits in these. I highly recommend if you just want to know about like how the comic book industry came about and the history Mm -hmm. of, of comics and the diversification of comics, like check out that series. Um, and then the last one, another one that I recently read, which is admittedly a much heavier read but a a very important read Uh, it actually just came out and it's called kent state four dead in ohio uh by durf backdurf uh who also did uh trashed and my friend Dahmer. um and that is a like heavily researched graphic novel about the kent state shooting um in Mm. 1970 um from the national guard uh and it's just um reading it i i was lucky enough we pop culture classroom full transparency has a free teaching guide coming out for that book um Mm -hmm. here hopefully early next week but because of that i got to read an advanced copy right around george floyd's death and the protests that started immediately after that Mm -hmm. and the parallels between 
the protests in the 1970s that are shown in, in Kent State and kind of the government response to that and the National Guard being sent in, um, the, the parallels between the 1970s and now that they detail in the book are just heartbreaking and stunning. And uh, if you're looking for some good nonfiction graphic literature like Kent State, Four Dead in Ohio, definitely go, go check that out. Mm -hmm. um, and then as kind of like a segue into our topic of the show, uh, today, no, yesterday, excuse me, yesterday, they just released the first of the um, Klaus spinoff Umbrella comics, uh, um, Umbrella Academy comics. So Klaus now has his own spinoff series and issue one just dropped yesterday. So I uh, nice. bought that today and I got to get into that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Topic of the show. Umbrella Academy. I don't have my tattoos like you do, Tara. I know, I got <laughs> like this, be like the the eye guy in Pam's Labyrinth. No. Yeah. If anyone, uh, <laughs> if anyone is listening to an audio only version of this, Tara has the hello goodbye on her hands uh, that Klaus has in the the comics and the TV show. <laughs> so the Umbrella Academy, right? It starts as a project from Gerard Way and Gab Gabriel Ba, uh, in I believe 2007. So. First of all, were either of you My Chemical Romance fans back in the day? Yes. <laughs> I wasn't really a fan, but I enjoyed some of their music. I got nice. to go to the um, Black Parade concert, and it was that. totally yeah. worth the fact that all of us got meningitis because, like, everyone in oh that gosh. line was like a 16 year old, like, hey, pass your <laughs> We all just met each other three hours ago. Let's all spit. So, uh -huh. yeah, we all got meningitis, but it was totally oh worth it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's that's a good story though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were front row and I remember so I dressed like the Helena outfits, but I mm. put a like red slip over my pants. And I was really glad because we were front row and the surge forward was so much that I my feet did not touch the ground most of the concert and my pants fell down. And <laughs> I could not, there were so many bodies, I could not slide my hands down my body from my pants. So wow. I was like, I'm so glad I wore a skirt over my pants. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I, I, was... I was not a small girl there. They just lifted me all the way up. <laughs> I, my, the Black Parade is like my second album, favorite album of all time. Um, nice. My Chemical Romance, like, especially as a teenager, that was just like, that would be part of like my identity if I had to describe it to somebody as a teenager. <laughs> I was such a big fan. Um, and I, th I think like so much of that Gerard Way, uh, My Chemical wow. Romance vibe comes through in the <laughs> Umbrella Academy so much. So we got mm -hmm. volume one, volume one was six issues, which is the Apocalypse Suite. Um, and that came out in 2007 to 2008. Um, if I'm getting things wrong, by the way, that's your job in the chat is to keep me, uh, to, to keep me factual. Fact yeah, yeah, give me those fact <laughs> checks. Um, but then the second series, um, the Umbrella Academy Dallas, uh, there were six issues there from 2008 to 2009. And then we did not get any more Umbrella Academy comics until 2019. Mm -hmm. um 2018 2019 um which is where we get uh hotel oblivion volume three and then now we are starting to get the klaus spinoff series uh and yeah. then of course there's the netflix adaptation too um so i want to just like y'all's first of all how much umbrella academy have you read how familiar are you with with it and i should probably preface this for our audience this we might have some spoilers in our discussion today you know and yeah. we want to make sure that we can have really good discussions about these things so if you are sensitive to spoilers go read this stuff it's real <laughs> good uh but go read that and then come back to this in the video on demand or in the podcast version but how much have you guys read and uh what are your thoughts what do you think about it so uh like you had said i uh read the first volume most of it probably yeah, when i was a teen here. Um, mm. when it came out and then I some point in my life collected a bunch of random issues that I found out yesterday when I went back to freshen up were a bunch of random issues of Dallas um, and man reading that and you saying like that there wasn't another issue for like 10 years like you're like no spoilers and I'm like so at the end yeah. but without, <laughs> no we, but we, without said, we said yes spoilers <laughs> yeah, true 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 yes, spoilers. Um, <laughs> Like, man, that I remember sitting there going, man, this ending would be such a bummer if I didn't know there was more. And then, like, I was like, man, there were 10 years when you didn't know there was going to be more. Yeah. Like, that's rough. Like, because, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the the end of Dallas is not 
an uplifting ending. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's kind of like, well, uh, what do we do now? Um, and I think it's crazy that like, uh, you know, he was, Gerard Way was writing this series as he was touring for the Black Parade, like their biggest album of all time had just dropped and he's on tour trying to write this, this series. There's actually in the, in the volumes, there's, you know, the, the, the letters that you get in the collected trades. And one of them was talking, the publisher was talking about how it would always be last minute for those scripts, like to get mm -hmm. to, to Gabriel Ba. Um, Dion, what do you, what do you think about this series? Yeah. Um, one of the things I love about uh, Gerard Way writing this series is because he really was one of like the first musicians to kind of like start bridging that gap of nerddom of mm -hmm. like, you know, musicians like breaking into comic books and stuff like that. So I really, really love the fact that he actually put out this book. Um, but just like Tara, um, I read uh, volume one a long time ago mm -hmm. and I just started reading Dallas. So I'm not very familiar with it just yet. But I, I love the Umbrella Academy. It's so well put together. And the art style is it's very unique. I think mm -hmm. the art is actually what first got me interested in the book just because I like you like the first image I remember seeing was the white violin and I was mm -hmm. just like whoa what's this about and yeah <laughs> yeah it kind of got me hooked I yeah. love like how how well the artist of this book uses like their their negative and positive space because yeah. like the, all the darks like really just kind of pull you in it's almost like a, a noir comic well, but it's with, such a great spot between detailed and simple too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so good. Um, and so I will say, uh, what's interesting about we we may have to have like a little follow up conversation next month because what's interesting about volume three is that because there were ten years in between, the art style evolved a slightly. You know, nothing drastic, mm -hmm. but I think it takes the the things that we love about the art in the first two volumes and just like takes it to the absolute next level yeah. with these incredibly vibrant colors and mm -hmm. it's very almost like psychedelic at points and it is gorgeous to look at so yeah. if y'all like i'm excited for y'all to get to volume three yeah. <laughs> i think it's also really interesting and this is something that i was thinking about when you said that you picked it up when you weren't really a comic reader and it totally mm. makes sense to me that that didn't jive because it is very much a comic book made for comic book fans like yeah. it expects you to know the language of comic books it does yeah. not bother to, to like pause and like give you time to catch up to the setting yeah. or anything like mm. that it just goes it expects you to know the shorthand it mm -hmm. expects you to just accept a lot of things like one of the things going from the TV show back to the comics. I was like, there are a lot more monkeys in this. And yeah. at first I was like, why? And then I was like, you know what? It doesn't matter why. And there's a lot of things like also the the Vietnam vampires where it's just like, you, you're not going to get an explanation about this. Just right. accept it and move forward. And that's yep. a very like comic logic -y thought, but I can see how that could also be like, I think this is a very, I, I'm not going to say it's the first meta e comic because obviously it's not, but like <laughs> it hits a meta e tone of like not making fun of it, not being uncritical of it, mm -hmm. but just being like, I love this and I'm making more of it. Like, mm -hmm. I love comics. So this is a comic that loves comics. Like, yeah. I mean, it has that my chemical romance energy to it where mm -hmm. it's just kind of mm -hmm. like, full steam ahead we're going you're with me you're along with the ride or if you can't keep up you're 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 in the dust you're dust right much. Um, like anti-cringe like no there's no cringe here we are just having fun and yeah. we're going <laughs> yeah yeah um <laughs> and even volume three i would so i i watched the tv series uh the first season long after it came out probably six to eight months after it came out mm -hmm. um and again had never read the comics at that point i had i read that one issue back in college um but hadn't really touched it since then and when i'm not gonna lie when i first picked up the um the comics i i didn't like them as much but at, now that I've reread them, because I just did a reread of volumes one and two and most of volume three, mm -hmm. I liked it a whole lot more. And yeah. I don't think it had anything to do with the TV show. I think I was just more accustomed to like the flow of the comic and how it talks to you and the pace of it. Um, and I was I think I was reading it more closely, too. And like there's so many little things that that you, you kind of got to catch in order to to keep up with everything. Mm -hmm. I also think the comic does a really good job. Like 
the TV show is definitely not an exact adaption of the comic. No, and not at all. <laughs> no. But like, it also, if you love the TV show and you read it, it's going to make you understand and that probably comes a lot from it being the same writer so like the changes that got made were made intentionally yeah to enrich the character of allison mm-hmm. of klaus of yeah. Luther, not to change them so it's not like you have to choose do i have my tv show head canon or my comic and there's a couple of, right like, klaus having a baby you do kind of gotta pick <laughs> like that one doesn't but like a lot of the things like i honestly the baby plot line could pop up in the show and still work yeah. like mm-hmm. like it doesn't clash with each other even though it's showing different parts of the story mm-hmm. and i think that's why is like i did have a little uh, same thing problem connecting to with him the first time because the comic book goes so fast and then mm-hmm. the tv show has time to really slow down and let you it see does the yeah little moments yeah. that make you fall in love with them there's a lot yeah. more time to breathe in the tv show for sure <laughs> absolutely yeah the um it started for pretty pretty quickly one of the things that i noticed like immediately is the comic book focused on them as children like a lot more mm. and the um the the tv show just kind of like kind of glossed over it but i understand why they made that choice because it would have made the series a lot longer <laughs> sure well i mean I, I don't know because like this is kind of my struggle with the adaptations we've gotten of it it is one of my favorite oh, yeah. books of all time mm-hmm. and what makes it work is going back and forth uh, between the kids and the adults because it gives you that yeah. relationship between you know the childhood struggles and how that informs the adults and that's what you get in yeah, the umbrella academy true. too is you get the how their childhood informs them as an adult and mm-hmm. you get that a little bit in the show um but not especially with season as two much. more i think yeah definitely season two more yeah, yeah. um so kind of talking about the, those touches. So there's a couple of specific things that I love. And I kind of want to hear a couple of the more like specific things that you guys love about the Umbrella Academy or don't love for that matter. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think one of the things that is so strong, whenever you have a family storyline, uh, a storyline that centers around family or features family, that's just such a good narrative to, device because everyone can relate to family and most people can relate to complex and complicated family, right? Yeah relationships between family members are often you know complex and strained there's so much history there and that's they dive into that in the umbrella academy comics and the tv show as well it's just like the family dynamic and how that that plays out between the individual members and it just it makes me invested as a reader i'm like Mm -hmm. oh uh, that relationship is tense that's tough right i think really well too at the show at different people having different like okay, like Luther and Allison doesn't feel weird because that's mm-hmm. their relationship. Yeah. Where, you know, everybody's relationship feels natural for what, like some people are almost yeah. sibling-ish. And then mm-hmm. some people very much have the vibe of we are children who just grew up in the same household and we have more of a like, we went to boarding school together vibe. Yeah. Mm, and yeah. like siblings who love each other, siblings who hate each other, siblings who are distant from, like you had a whole between the seven of them and all their inner relationships, you got almost every kind of relationship possible. Yeah, that di- yeah. different so dynamics. Well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And it's really hard. I know a lot of people like they first want to say, you know, like, who is your favorite character on the Umbrella Academy? And I honestly it's I couldn't pick rank. one. Yeah, they're so <laughs> yeah. they're so great. I love like most of them actually. Also, <laughs> shout out to the kid that plays five. Holy I know. Cow. I forget that he's not actually a like fourteen year old kid all yeah. the time. He yeah. was great in season one and just nailed it in season, in season two. two right? He's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I wish though, man, I wish. So I'm assuming they're saving it for something. I wanted my chemical romance song in the show and I yeah. wish it had been I'm not okay when he was fighting mm. his old self. Like, <laughs> the song they chose was good, but man, I was like waiting for it. And I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> a little off topic, but the song choices in Umbrella Academy, the TV show, they remind me a lot. I don't know if you guys are watching Lovecraft Country right now. Not yet. Um, but the song choices they're doing in Lovecraft Country, whoever's doing the the audio the soundtrack design for that is just it's like jordan peele to the mask that max they incorporate great hip-hop like i heard la nice. 47 in there I also love uh, those yeah spoken pieces that they'll use in there like the yeah. news clips and mm-hmm. and oh yeah so I, oh 
I was going to say, I did note the, the guy who chooses or the person who chooses the music for the fight scenes does not watch the fight scenes before he chooses it. And I love oh, wow. that for some reason. <laughs> That's cool. Huh. Interesting. And so another interesting fact, just quickly about the show, because we're talking about it. So back when cons were a thing, uh, I had the, the privilege of going to C2E2 in Chicago this past year. Nice. And uh, Robert Sheehan and... Um, Oh, I'm I'm blanking on her name right this second, but the actress who plays Allison um, of Hamilton fame, um, mm-hmm. sh- they they were speaking at Chicago's Comic Con. One thing that I found really interesting was that the writers of the show, when they start filming, the entire series is not written. Like the whole season is not written. Oh, they wow. may have three episodes worth of finished scripts when they start filming. Mm-hmm. And then they continue to develop those scripts and change things. Yes, thank you, uh, Chris Angel, uh, Emmy Raver Lampman. Thank you. Um, and I hope I said that correctly. Correctly. <laughs> um, but they they continue writing the show as they're filming it. And so some things kind of move around. And uh, I thought that was interesting because season one of the show takes kind of volume one and volume two of the comics and all the best things of those two volumes and kind of mashes them together. Nice. And then when we got to season two of the show, it was kind of like, okay, we're in Dallas. Uh, Kennedy's going to get assassinated. Mm-hmm. And uh, not really much else from that storyline made it into season two. <laughs> Um, oh man, I also, I was really impressed how season two, some of the stuff that was maybe not so well dealt with in season one, like season two so neatly, like, for example, the kill your queers trope. I know some people were upset about that with uh, Klaus's boyfriend dying and like mm-hmm. season two brought that back to a hopeful place. Like I felt like, and there was a lot of different incidents where like, and I really liked that, like. I don't know if they were responding or if it was just a matter of like, you need to wait for it to develop, which is something that I think sometimes we forget to do currently. Um, <laughs> but like, it was just really nice to see that a lot of the things that in season one, I've been like, mm, they also responded to and felt similar to, and that just always makes me happy. <laughs> yeah. I, I really like how a lot of like the common tropes that you'll see in like a lot of television shows, as far as like, um, you know, characters that are supposed to be like the the smart one of the group or like the uh, the killer of the group. Mm. Like they went into so much more detail with a lot of their personalities that you kind of understand why they are the way they are. And they don't really have like, there's no Captain America. There's no Batman of the group. Like they're, they, mm. they're written more like real people, which yeah. I really love. Um. So but we have a few minutes left for Umbrella Academy. Liz, Liz on the ones and twos, our producer, Liz. Uh, I had sent <laughs> you a picture, um, the one with the squid. I don't know if you're able to bring that up uh, and show the folks who are watching on the YouTubes. Um, <laughs> so this is, uh, while well, Liz hopefully is able to get that, I just sprung it. Yes, see? I was like, nice. I just sprung a request on her, but she's got it. She's awesome. Shout out to Liz. <laughs> um, so this is the very first panel of season one. And or season one, excuse me, volume one of yeah. the, <laughs> the comic series. Um, I have a theory and I want to know if I'm like reading way too much into this or see what you guys think. Um, so I just kind of like, Gerard Way is a man of many pop cultures, right? Mm-hmm. And so he's going to reference different things. And, you know, you can see references and reflections of different things throughout the series. And mm-hmm. my theory is, I think, so it starts, it's like, uh, it, it happened on the night that the space squid, I think is what they refer to it as, uh, was defeated. He was defeated with a, a flying elbow. Mm-hmm. Um, when you think of space squids, Watchmen. what do you think of? Watchmen. Yes. Watchmen, yeah. <laughs> Right. Yep. I, so, I was actually going to compare it to Watchmen earlier with its meta-ness too. <laughs> yeah. And so, and you know, it might be uh, the HBO Watchmen series kind of not tainting, but informing my thoughts here, but I'm, I'm kind of like, so the space squid in Watchmen is supposed to symbolize um, unity, right? He, it's something along the lines of he brings in the space squid to kill a bunch of people to bring the world together. Yeah, and right? also a naive, a naive unity. I feel like the, the out of character conversation about that ending is how naive it would be, especially in current times, to assume that a squid would, would, would 
make that happen. <laughs> yeah, and I actually saw a meme about this the other day that was like, that dude in Watchmen, if he could see us now about how catastrophes don't bring people together. Right. Uh, I thought it was <laughs> kind of funny. Uh, but, you know, I love this opening. And if, if that is his intention to be kind of that reference, I love that it's kind of symbolizing that it already from, from the jump, this and this kind of jumps into actually what I was thinking. Uh, you know, we, we want to talk about how this comic can be used for good, right? At Pop mm -hmm. Culture Classroom, we're all about how do we use pop culture for good, for educational purposes, right? Mm -hmm. And so to me, this is such a great uh, kind of world building just to start out with to say like, you know, people are not united in this world. This is not a united world. This is mm -hmm. a world, uh, you know, where the, and you see the world building move on, but it's an ugly world where people are kind of at odds with each other. And then we see all these kind of like super villain, essentially esque folk throughout the series. Um, mm -hmm. And that the the killing of the squid, that like ending of that unity possibly is what caused or, you know, uh, prompted the birth of all of these, you know, uh, uh, kids with all these powers with from mm -hmm. mothers that were never pregnant, right? Yeah. I don't know, am I reading too much into that or what do you no, guys think? No, no, like <laughs> as soon as you brought it up, I was like, oh man, that's a squid from Watchmen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I also think like you were talking about good stuff. I think a really good thing to take from Umbrella Academy too is like, we talked about it being family and like a lot of Gerard Way's inspiration was his band members interacting. Mm -hmm. And like, this is in the comics, but I think the TV show does show it even better. Is like, you have all these flawed people, some of who are really, truly flawed. This isn't yeah. like, this isn't like, oh, you know, she's flawed. She forgets to fold her laundry. Like, no, they, they are some really messed up people. Mm -hmm. And like, it grapples with that. It does not forgive mm. it. Right. It also doesn't say, well, you've made mistakes you're done, get out of my face. And like, mm. so like, I think a really good example is Vanya because like, I think Vanya, mm -hmm. her crime against her family is something that a lot of us can easily do. She <laughs> overshares and gets stuck in her own head and hurts mm -hmm. people from it. Yeah. And like, even though that is then blown up to these superhero proportions, that's, that's a very real thing. And that's a very real skill. And like, to to look at what do you do when your friend's a drug addict how do you yeah. how do you still love them how are you still there mm -hmm. for them when are you not there for them because that hurts you like yeah. right yeah when is your psychotic little brother who doesn't age when do you step in like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and i'm really actually like loving the trend of um a lot of writers have actually i feel like they've actually been studying like um mental issues and things like mm. that because the way that a lot of the characters are portrayed is very believably like mm. you, you believe that you know the rate the reason that they're the way they are is because of their childhood mm. and the more they show of how their dad treated them like you can understand why they turned out the way they did yeah and it's, it's believable and i love I that and it's that family di dynamic again. It's relatable because how many of us have been there where at one point or another, we feel like we've been shunned by a family member, right? Yeah. And, you know, or had those those tough relationships. They mm -hmm. have to keep being vulnerable with each other. And vulnerable right. is one of the hardest things to be. And I think mm -hmm. that's really one of the core things is when they won't be vulnerable with each other, they fail. And when they will be vulnerable with each other, they succeed. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right, well, that's the topic of the show. And that is oh, just wow. about going to wrap us up. Yeah, it's been an hour, right? Wow. <laughs> um, I'm like, I could keep going. Let's I go. Know, right? you know? <laughs> uh, folks, if you liked this content, uh, you know, let us know. Drop a comment on the YouTube uh, comments or in the chat. Give us a thumbs up, a like, a subscribe, or a share. Um, so PopStream is just getting started. This was just episode one. And thank you so much, Tara and Dion. I loved this yeah, conversation. No problem. Me too. Awesome. I can't wait to bring in some guests to join us and, Absolutely. you know, just have those fresh perspectives too. Yeah. Um, so pop stream, we've got more coming up next week. We've got the pop stream workshop featuring our guest, Dustin Resch to teach us how to create unconventional superheroes. So kind of following this theme here, mm -hmm. um, week after that, <laughs> we'll have pop stream, a V club where we're talking about the boys on Amazon prime. And then finally we've got pop stream DPCC flashback where we're showing the science of Wakanda from last year's Denver pop culture con. So yes. you are getting content every week live on Thursdays where you can join us in the chat or Video on demand available Tuesdays at 10 a.m. And then podcast services coming soon. Um, again, a like, a subscribe, a share would be so, 
so helpful to us as we kind of build out this new project. Um, and then finally, this is a project of Pop Culture Classroom, which is our Denver-based nonprofit. Um, we've talked a little bit about here about it here today, but we are an educational nonprofit. And Tara and Dion, we didn't even mention this. You guys are instructors for our nonprofit yes. work. So they go <laughs> out to our schools, our libraries, our community centers, and teach literacy and engagement and writing through comics and board games and video games and any kind of pop culture media. We use that in schools and community centers around the Denver area to engage students. We also create a line of historical comics called Colorful History. Both of you guys have been artists on Colorful History. Mm -hmm. um, so those are free resources you can download on our website, but we need your help to keep this work going. Um, to be frank, we don't have Denver Pop Culture Con this year, which is where most of our funding yeah. comes from. And, um, you know, we could use any help we got. So on the screen right now, you should see a donate link. If you're feeling generous, if you're able to, we would love a donation to help us get this, continue this educational work um, and support our organization um, as we get through the struggles of COVID that we know everyone is, is going through yeah. right now. Um, but with that, I cannot wait to see you guys next week for our pop stream workshop, Dion and Tara. We will all see you all next month for comics episode two, all about lock and key and Sandman. So get reading. Yes. And until then, this has been your pop stream and I'm going to pop a bottle Goodbye. in celebration. Nice. Thank you everybody. <laughs> we'll see you later. Yeah. Take care you guys. Thank you so much. Man. <laughs> yes. Bye Liz.